So the research project and actually the first phase that I wanted to talk to you about is looking at the efforts of the refugee advocacy community in taking the Harper government to court. And um, what we did in the first phase of the project is that we pretty much did a paper-based review of some of the court cases and because we were invited to be um, in a conference mainly by political scientists and public policy people who have this heightened uh, perspective of what uh, courts and litigation can do, um, we started out with these three goals. One of them was to finally demystify the uh, Singh case that public policy people seem to be um, having in their head is this, this one case that seems to have made courts this really influential decision maker. Um, and then the second goal was that we were starting this project at the end of the Harper government that we thought it was probably time to reflect and look at the Harper government's um, period in power and in particular their rights restrictive refugee policy as an example to start this conversation about taking down the influence of the courts a notch and to look at a really aggressive uh, rights restrictive government in doing so. Um, but the third um, goal of the paper was also to try to inject some social legal conversations into a political science conversation that's very much dominated about this assumption that we have a court decision and then there is an impact and this impact is kind of taken for granted in the way that a lot of the research in this community works. So we were literally the people at a workshop that were talking about legal mobilization and about some of the literature that's very familiar to law and society scholars but that often gets ignored or not cited or not incorporated. So that's part of the conversation that plays out in this paper and I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of um, what we did but the second phase of the research will be to get away from our preliminary paper-based stuff that um, is already under review as part of an edited volume and then go and talk to the community people and we both have different networks so we're just doing all the wonderful ethics paperwork to do with that. Um, yes, collective sigh goes into the room. So Harper government, quick reminder in case you all um, don't remember, it was 26 to 2015, a very distinct period but as you will see later on it's actually if you're then looking at how you're going to trace court cases it's actually not long enough because a lot of the cases are still either going on or they were concluded in the Trudeau government, which is an interesting just methodological question um, just to flash to you. So what um, we um, did, um, just to give you the quick uh, preview of the argument, was that we were puzzled by actually a classic contradiction and that we see um, that the role of the courts in a policy area is very limited if you actually dig into the details but there still was a significant degree of mobilization in the refugee advocacy community during this particular time period. Totally understandable, what, but what's of course fascinating is why is there still this lure to the courts? If the advocates know that of courts the avenues are limited, why is there still this lure? Overall, what we found particularly interesting um, in terms of the impact of going to court is that perhaps the impact of the changes on the advocacy community, new organizations that were being found, and um, the people that are still in the room may know these, the Canadian Association for Refugee Lawyers um, was founded during this period, and then um, also the Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care, I'll talk about them if I have a few minutes later. So some. Um, shifts in the networks occurred and so perhaps this is the more important legacy and perhaps the more important impact of going to court than actually some of these victories or no victories and we can talk a little bit about this if I have time. Um, the argument about the rights restrictive Harper period 26 2006 and 2015 that we make in the paper it's that is not it wasn't just a rights restrictive government but it was a government that actually tried to shift the very foundation um, upon which refugee rights in Canada are based and by that we mean that um, if you look at all the details and we talk about them in the paper there was a consistent effort to just go into all the different areas of refugee policy and law and determination that I don't have time to talk to you about and to shift many of them to a discretionary basis or to shift some of them to the minister and to take rights and review mechanisms away. 
And that really is not just rights restriction, but it's shifting the foundation. And that is also something um, that we think is really unique and is something that we need to talk about. But Canada in the international context is, of course, always my colleague Rebecca Hamlin in the States that's written an, who's written an interesting book talks about the Cadillac model. So Canada is always admired. So some uh, comparativists would say, but now we're just taking down um, Canada a notch to what some of the other governments already do. But um, just to highlight three areas that have already been mentioned um, by my fellow panelists is that the first area of preoccupation of the Harper government to, is to make just the general travel to and enter to Canada more difficult. Um, there were interesting things done to visa uh, restrictions, safe third country exemptions removed. So this is just uh, one area. Then, of course, it was being made more difficult to actually pursue a refugee claim. Um, um, I think uh, Stephanie already mentioned the legislation, the Fund Balanced Refugee Act, the Protecting Canadian Immigration System. And all of this was about the acceleration of claims and, again, taking away um, appeal options. But there is this one interesting moment that we also talk about in the paper, the creation of the Refugee Appeal Division, and I can talk about this if you don't um, know what this means. But there are all these categories that were created, um, designated countries, so the countries, if you come from them, they're considered safe, or again, similar to the Safe Third Country Agreement, if you've traveled through it, then um, you must file your claim in the United States and not in Canada. Um, as Stephanie already talked about, the Harper government also made it much harder to remain in Canada. There was um, also all sorts of little pre-removal risk assessment. There were appeal mechanisms removed if you fell into one of these categories. Um, then there was the social, we haven't covered the social area Harper government thing. There was stuff about work permits that were removed for certain people in certain categories. Um, the government also went much more aggressively after people who um, had gone back to their country of origin and who were then therefore um, forced to um, cede their refugee status, those so-called cessation cases. So overall, if you were not familiar with the Harper government, it was very much a constrained um, political environment to um, challenge it in the standard arenas that we in political science and public policy often talk about, and that is, for example, hearings for some of these um, bills, for some of these pieces of legislation, and we talk about some of them in the paper. There were no opportunities, there was no consultation with the community, um, the opportunity for hearings were closed, or there was only a certain time period put upon them. So in the paper, we talk about how if you are making strategic choices to resist a rights-restrictive government, then of course you try to get into the standard arenas of achieving policy change, or at least resisting rights-restrictive policy change. But this government um, then also um, made fun of certain advocates, also demonized um, doctors, and there are some quotes and some examples from Jason Kenney and from some other members of parliament. Um, in the paper, so it was not just people then went, um, especially the doctors, that was the surprising one, the doctors were then portrayed as these strange lefty advocates. So if you're thinking about the political environment and where refugee advocates were going, it was risky to be operating in this environment, and it was actually um, quite impossible to do much of anything other than say that you were against these um, changes that were taking place. So then if you think about um, some of the difficulties, and some of them have already been alluded to by some of the other presenters of um, appealing, and the word appeal should not even be used in this context, a negative refugee determination. Uh, we can talk about some more if you are interested. There is actually an administrative law procedure that um, is basically because it's a judicial review procedure that allows the, the judge much less power to actually get into the substance of the case. There's also a, processual, a special procedural requirement within the federal court hierarchy where your case to go from the federal court to the federal court of appeal, you have to have a basically an important question in your case to even get the appeal granted. That's called the certification of a question. And we did some counting of how many questions there are, but if you think about this from the, is this an avenue worth pursuing? Of course, there's also the leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's really difficult because there are all these procedural hurdles in the way to make a, claim in the courts. 
Yet still, if you look at the track records, and then we did in the paper, we did a mapping, a description of the policy changes, and then we tried to find out which of these changes were actually litigated, and in particular, which of them were litigated with the support of some of the advocacy organizations. So again, there's the Canadian Council for Refugees and uh, CARL, so the Canadian Association for Refugee Lawyers. They were the two most frequent interveners in the cases that we were studying. Um, but still, if you map the cases, there were a couple or three that made it to the Supreme Court of Canada in this time period. They, some of them were not even cases they had to do with human smuggling. You might remember um, some of them. They were not even cases that technically were based on Harper government policy changes. So it's kind of a weird picture that emerges and that I can talk a little bit more about in the questions if you are interested. Um, so if you look at the empirical picture, the question still remains, well, why did the community go to court? Um, so what we did then in the paper is that we took the um, interim federal health program cuts case and that we looked at this in a little bit more detail and then we show that in the coming together of even the provincial governments and the um, various medical association bodies that a different kind of change occurred in the movement and also in the way that the legal claim was then phrased in the federal court that we think will be the longer lasting legacy than the fact that the interim federal health cuts were overturned at the federal court. And some of you may remember that the Harper government had um, said that they would appeal the, uh, the win, uh, so the rights expansion back to the restoration of the original interim federal health cut. Um, so the interim federal health program would be restored um, so that when the Harper government said that they would appeal that again, but then the election happened, so the actual policies changed, the rights expansive policy change did not occur until the Trudeau government came into power. And we think that if you were to look at some of the other cases, um, some of them, the, there were some other cases during this time period where the Trudeau government equally said that they would not go forward with the appeal. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk about some of the details. So the question still remains, is um, legal mobilization um, worth pursuing? And also, do we as social scientists have to rethink the impact of the courts if there are so few cases? Of course, that one case could make a big difference, one could argue, but in terms of resources for the advocacy community, is it still worth pouring the strategic money into these cases? Of course, one could say there are no alternatives, and then the paper we say, well, in this case, there really weren't any alternatives, and that is really ultimately what pushed advocacy community um, money and resources into the courts. But I wanted to talk a little bit, um, if I have, oh, I've got two minutes, okay. So let me talk in two minutes a little bit about um, the legal mobilization picture. Legal mobilization is often portrayed as, is there the right kind of legal stock? So are there legal norms? Is there the right kind of legal resources? Are there advocates? Are there lawyers? Is there money? And then is there access to the courts? So access was really difficult to obtain. There were certainly lots of resources. And the rights uh, stock picture is also a tricky one. Because if you look at the record, um, there are some people that have said, well, the international, it sounds like refugees are protected internationally, but domestically it's often not about rights if you actually look at the cases. So the charter really is, Catherine Duverney has done a really interesting study, the charter really is almost underutilized by judges in these settings. But the political science and public policy literature often assumes that if there are court cases, there's impact, there's policy change. But the legal mobilization literature says, well, perhaps the change that occurs should be measured and looked at in the way that community, community advocates shift and come together, and then they can perhaps, under a different period, bring about policy change. But the policy change is not going to happen because you have that one-off court case. And in particular, um, that one-off court case from long ago, the Singh decision has been turned back and has been um, rolled back significantly if you had time to look at that. 
I'm just making sure that um, I haven't missed anything really important because I figured the last person to go I can cut the most. Um, so, so I hope that in um, the first part of the paper where we were just trying to figure out how are we actually going to measure this? How are we going to look at the Harper's track record? How are we going to count the cases and then figure out which of the Harper government policy changes actually made it into the courts? What was the outcome? How were we going to score this? We think we do have a, a picture now, but now we want to go back to the community, to the lawyers, to the people that we know, and actually find out, well, how did you strategize? Does what we um, have found, does it make sense? And how do you see your position now um, that the Trudeau government is in power? And we've heard some um, anecdotal evidence already, so it will be interesting to see. But the question still is, is the bigger legacy really that shift in that mobilization against the rights restrictive government during that time period. So will that be the lasting legacy? Thanks very much.